So we're going to get started. Uh, you know, there's a few people just finishing up at the buffet, but we want to make sure um, we can get adequate time with our uh, panelists, right, and our interviews. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Cooney, president of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to a very special edition of Good Day Metro South. This is our monthly Lunch and Learn program that we hold uh, mostly here at Thorny Lee. Uh, and it's so nice to be here at Thorny Lee Golf Club. I want to thank Rich Campbell and uh, Sharon Guthrie and the staff for their uh, assistance today. Today we're very pleased to be hosting a special economic development panel featuring individuals who are from leading businesses, consulting firms, housing developers, and the city planning office uh, to discuss updates and opportunities in the economic development space. We will hear from them a little bit later, and we're looking forward to it. You can see their names and faces up here now. We are very pleased to be hosting this program in partnership with the South Shore Bank, uh, and we'd like to acknowledge our guests from the Leadership South Shore program who are here with us today. Please raise your hand if you're with the cohort from Leadership South Shore. Welcome. <laughs> Leadership South Shore was established in 2016 by the South Shore Bank in partnership with South Shore Chamber of Commerce. This celebrated program selects participants from a pool of applicants and leads them through a year-long immersive learning curriculum, resulting in a group of individuals who are committed to transformative leadership in our community. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, again, let's have a round of applause for them. And we also have a group of students from Southeastern Tech. Please raise your hands. Uh, they are full-time interns. They come in for a week of an immersive uh, experience, and then they go back uh, to, and they study. And they, it's kind of like a Northeastern type of uh, situation where they're, they're learning and acting and, uh, and being uh, what they, they want to be when they go forward. So um, I also want to thank Jim Dunphy, Joanne Tully, Stan Blackmore, and Peter Foreman for their leadership of Leadership South Shore. Let's have a round of applause for them. At this time, I want to call your attention to these green sheets on your tables. If you have a question for our panelists and we have time, we will ask that question. So I uh, just ask you to fill it out and hold it in the air. One of the chamber staff or ambassadors will grab it and uh, we will uh, Include it in our question portion. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, the mayor of Brockton, Bob Sullivan, to say a few words of welcome today. Thank you. Mayor. Well, good morning. It was a good afternoon. I don't know. The day is kind of blend. But uh, I first of all want to welcome you to the City of Champions, Brockton, Massachusetts. If you're a visitor, kindly raise your hand. All right, we welcome you. You can buy a house, register to vote, and I'll love you. <laughs> No, so I consider this one happy family, and when there's a family member hurting, we, we embrace that family member. Chris Cooney is a dear friend of all of us, and he lost his mom, Jenny. So I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor uh, Chris's mom at this time, please. Thoughts and prayers are with you, Chris, and your family. Thank you. So I, I'm here again, and I don't know why I keep getting invited back. They're like, that kid's got the worst Brockton accent I've ever heard. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, we are better together. And I am truly business uh, oriented, and I'll tell you why. It's not just because I had a million of these printed up, right? It's because I understand that our economic drive, the tools in the toolbox to take us to the next level, is contingent upon everybody in this room. The investment, uh, everybody here in terms of the professional acronym and how we can collectively work together to better not just the city of Brockton, where I proudly serve as mayor, but the region as a whole. Now, I grew up in the city of Brockton, and a lot of people, and then I went on to BC and all this stuff, and a lot of people would say to me, Brockton, Mass, is not in the South Shore. And please block your ears, my mom and dad aren't here. I'd always say, that's bullshit. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay? It is. And people would say, no, it's not. Well, you know what? I know it is because the Boston Globe magazine, a week ago Sunday, if you flipped it over on the back, it had four communities. It had Hull, Plymouth, Marshfield and Brockton. So we are in the South Shore. That's a fact. If it's in the Globe, it's true. So I, uh, I just want to tell you that um, we will continue to work with businesses that are here. There's no doubt about that. We will continue to give TIFs and TIEs and HDIPs and all those fancy acronyms. But I'm looking to bring more businesses to Brockton. We have 750 housing units in the queue right now. I was just invited to Providence, Rhode Island, and I gave a talk 
to about 20 different business people and I think 13 different mayors in Rhode Island about Brockton's experience with transit-oriented development, right? We are leveraging the train, simple as that. And if we can leverage the train and we can leverage the uh, professional acronym of everybody in here, we're on that trajectory that I'm, I'm shooting for. Now, COVID, uh, I was just invited to give the commencement speak at, at Cardinal Spellman uh, coming up in May. And when I went home and told my wife and my kids, they said, why you? <laughs> and so Sidney Merrill, my best chief of staff in the entire world, said to me, well, it's because you're the COVID mayor and the graduating class were freshmen during COVID. And that's mayor, that's why that's happening. And so I will tell you this, we have learned through COVID that if we work together, we truly work together, not just from a healthcare component, but a business component, the sky's the limit. And what was illustrated last night, last night I was in Quincy, Massachusetts, and I wanna thank Jim and his team that invited me. Uh, mayor Coke has brought Quincy to another level, right? There's no doubt about that. And I kid the mayor and I, I kidded Steve Lynch, the congressman last night, that that's the city of presidents. The city of champions always trumps a president, there's no doubt about that. So I am gonna say today, you're gonna learn from esteemed folks, people that really can educate and inform us. And as the mayor, my door is always, always, always open and I am running again. I'm gonna to continue to work with you, but I'm gonna work for you. So have a great day and let's continue to work together, roll up the sleeves and get the job done. God bless you all. Thank you, mayor, as you can see, our uh, folks from the Leadership South Shore, we've got great leadership here and are committed to working with businesses going forward. Uh, and speaking of that, we have a wonderful chairman this, this year. Uh, Rich Hines is the president of Barber Corporation. Barber Corporation has been here for 135 years. Uh, and Rich's family has run this business with about 100 employees um, for about half of that time. And uh, so we're delighted to have you here to kick us off as MC. Thank you. Rich Hines. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here, and it's great to see all of you here. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking our Chamber Ambassadors uh, in attendance today. Mary Baker, HR Alternatives. Suzanne Fernandez, Northeast Savings Bank. Richard Hook, SCU Credit Union. Felicita Sapluvra, Cape Verdean Association of Brockton. Kelly Tarvers, Brockton Re Redevelopment Authority. Marcy Venenzia, Above the Clouds. Jose Camacho, Dedham Savings. I'd like to also thank our chamber board members in attendance today. Sue Joss, uh, Brockton Neighborhood Association, Health, so Health Center, excuse me. George Spilios, Crown Uniform and Living Service. And also Joe Casey, Harbor One Bank. Finally, I'd like to thank our elected, selected, and state officials for their attendance today. Mayor Robert Sullivan, Senator Mike Brady, Brockton City Councilor Moises Rodriguez, and Brockton City Councilor David Tessiera. I'd like to now introduce our sponsors. Uh, today's Good Day Metro South program is being sponsored in part by South Shore Bank and Atlantic Mechanical. Established in 1833, South Shore Bank is a full service mutual bank and after a recent merger has approximately $4 billion in assets. Their newest branch is soon to open in Brockton this spring. <laughs> Atlantic Mechanical is a family owned business located on the South Shore for over 25 years. Atlantic Mechanical specializes in all aspects of commercial refrigeration, energy, energy conservation, HVAC design, and bill services. Jim Dumphy and Paul Grata, please come up and have a seat. It's now my pleasure to introduce our interviewer for today's program. Please welcome Stan Blackmer, owner, publisher, Black Rock Advertising, and South Shore Magazine. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone, to this last event of the Thorny Lee Country Club. And uh, thanks to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce for the uh, invite for all of us today. 
I've got two esteemed uh, <coughs> social or business people here with me, Joe Grada and Jim Duffy. And just going to ask them a couple of brief questions, but I know we have a panel discussion that's coming up that uh, has some really uh, intriguing questions and will inform everyone so whereabouts on the South Shore. So Joe, um, we, we're given a brief uh, synopsis of your business, but just uh, tell us a little bit more about Atlantic Mechanical and your uh, affiliation here in Metro South and on the South Shore. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, appreciate that. I'm really happy to be a part of this uh, preamble panel. Um, uh, we've been in, in operation actually in Weymouth, Massachusetts for over 40 years. Um, and this is a second generation family business. I actually also do uh, real estate development, built uh, an apartment building actually just about six minutes away from uh, our, our office. I know it's that, that far away because I live there and I commute from there every single day. If I hit a red light, it takes about 30% longer to get there. So. <laughs> Uh, we, we invest here, we're, we're very much a part of the community, uh, being a part of the South Shore Chamber, being uh, one of the inaugural members of the uh, uh, South Shore Leadership Program, I've seen a tremendous amount of development in these communities, and seeing the leadership that's risen from these places has been just really inspiring and continues to be. We go back this way. <laughs> Jim, uh, as the president of uh, Social Bank, we had the uh, big news of your merger with uh, Denim Savings Bank recently, and uh, creating a big footprint here in uh, Metro South, uh, which the mayor mentioned the opening of the uh, new branch here in Brockton, but uh, there's some other big news coming up that uh, will pertain to uh, Joe and I's roles in the South Shore leadership group, but there is now going to be uh, Metro South leadership, and uh, that's going to be starting up in May, so I'm told. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So, you know, we've always felt it was important, uh, you know, to bring people together. And this isn't a leadership program in like an MBA. It's to learn more about your community and see what's going on and then how you can impact it. And uh, I learned about it. I lived up in New Hampshire for a while, and they had some great programs. I brought it to Peter Foreman, and uh, he said, geez, this is like a PhD in leadership. I, I don't have the staff for this. It looks great. And so we kept you know, going back and forth and figuring out how. And uh, what I wanted to make sure is that it had, uh, I'm a big believer in regional, too. And so you know, like the South Shore Chamber and the Metro, you know, not one community in and of itself, we've got to work together. As, as, as the mayor mentioned, you know, all one big family, and as we, we go there. So it took us a couple of years to get it off the ground. I do think, Joe, you were in the first class. And, you know, and we kind of winged it <coughs> each day that it came up and it went very well. And it really started clicking. Then we had to fight through the pandemic. You know, a lot was virtual, and this is meant to be in person, interacting, a big part of how the cohort works with each other is the bus rides. <coughs> talking about what you just saw, how you went there. And so then we wanted to roll it out. Personally, I, I grew up in Abington, so, you know, and, and like the mayor said, I, you know, defining the South Shore is hard. I didn't grow up in any water. I, you know, we were part of it. We had different things, Portland County, South Shore, Norfolk County's in there. You know, so how do we, how we measure all that? And so the South Shore was a big part of me growing up, and also Brockton. Bordering town for Brockton here. Uh, my first real job it was for a trust company where I'm Main Street here in Brockton. Um, so I have a lot of ties to it. So I think it's important. And how do we make you know our pond better through these programs? So the chambers are important. These leadership programs, and uh, you know the leadership program has generated tremendous support for the chamber. A lot of board members. Joe, you've been affiliated with the chamber through this program. Yeah, exactly. And you will be next year's chairman. I will be chair, chair of the South Shore Chamber next year. So that's great. So I look forward to it. You know, it should be as successful for the Metro South as we've had for the South Shore. And let's continue to make our communities better. Just to wrap up, I'd just like to quickly add, uh, I was in the second class of the South Shore Leadership Program, and uh, Peter Foreman sitting over at the table there. I've been doing business here on the South Shore in, in Mass Eastern Massachusetts for over 35 years in various capacities. And, and Peter goes, well, 
what, what are you do, doing sitting here? And I said, look, it's, it's an opportunity to really learn more about businesses that make up the fabric of our community. And I was always visiting businesses on our marketing and sales capacity. But going to visit these businesses and organizations, you, as part of this leadership program, really get to peel back the onion and see the inner workings of what these fine organizations that you get to see on a, a, a tour um, one whole day. There's six different categories that are covered. So I think you guys that are gonna be participating in this program are gonna really get a lot out of it. The affiliation with the Chambers and the bet and South Shore Bank is uh, integral to help facilitate and pay for it, but it's well, well worth it. If you haven't, uh, when the applications come out, get them in quickly because uh, there is an interview process and a li limited number of spots, but if you're even on the fence about considering doing it, I would highly recommend it as a, a graduate and as a business person. So I guess we're on to the next uh, level of our day. Thank you very much. Small token of our appreciation. Thank you, sir. Change of pants. <laughs> the They're good pants, they really work. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel for today's uh, program. First, I'd like to welcome George Spilios, Crown Uniform and Lin Linen Services. If you want to come up as I, as I uh, mention you. George is the co-president of Crown Uniform and Lin Linen Service, a family-owned and operated independent uniform rental and linen service that's been serving New England for over 100 years. After studying communications at Hamilton College, George joined the now fourth generation family business in 2005. He currently oversees sales, service, and the extraordinarily advanced eco-friendly plant location in Brockton. Next on our panel is Lynn Tukarzik. <laughs> and she is with Business Development Strategies. Founded in 2003, Lynn is a former regional director of the Massachusetts Office of Business Development and senior manager for Ernst & Young, where the business development strategies team helped companies across a wide spectrum of industries identify, negotiate, and secure state and local tax incentives to help accelerate real estate expansion plans. We're happy Lynn will be sharing some of the most beneficial incentives for business today. Also on the panel is Rob Corley, NeighborWorks Housing Solutions. <laughs> Rob is the CEO of NeighborWorks Housing Solutions and Executive Director of NeighborWorks Southern Mass. He's a graduate of Wentworth Institute of Technology's Construction Management Program and also holds a Master's in Community and Economic De Development from Southern New Hampshire University. Rob has completed several new housing and mixed-use developments in Quincy and has established himself and NeighborWorks as a reliable creator of new housing construction in Brockton. Finally, I'd like to welcome Rob May. <laughs> Rob is, as you know, Brockton City Planner. Rob joined Brockton, the city of Brockton in 2014 as a director of planning and economic development. He has an MBA from Indiana University and has worked in many cities, including Chicago, Illinois, Somerville, Mass. Rob has worked steadily and effectively to create admirable vision for the future of Brockton. This vision includes more Main Street development, more housing at every level, and more commercial construction within the business districts citywide. And I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna start with George Spilios. Take it away, George. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Rich. Thank you, the Chamber, uh, Mayor, 
and uh, South Shore Leadership Group. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to talking a little bit about Brown and uh, our journey to Brockton, um, which was 10 years ago, which is re really hard to believe. So, um, so Crown inspires confidence in its customers by providing efficient, cost-effective uniform and linen programs with a personal touch. Uh, for 100 years, we've remained family-owned and committed to building long-lasting relationships with our customers. So. Uh, that's my, myself on the left, uh, my father, my uncle Arthur, and my, my cousin Plato. So currently it's a fourth generation family business, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the history of the company um, as, we, as we move through these slides. Um, this is our current service map. Um, our corporate office is in Nashua, New Hampshire, um, as well as our warehouse and the service department. And Brockton is the home of our processing plant. Um, sales are in Providence, Rhode Island, and then we have two service departments in uh, Windsor and Milford, Connecticut. Uh, these are the industries that we serve, um, healthcare, food service, manufacturing, and education. Um, this is really in a little bit more detail on, you know, of those verticals, you know, what types of customers we're servicing. And, and really, typically, what we're doing is going out and buying the merchandise, buying the lab coats and the scrubs, and and providing those on a weekly service to a customer, uh, picking up the dirty every week and delivering the clean. So this is a little more information on which products we're servicing to which customers. So a um, little little history about Crown. So um, I'm fourth generation uh, in the family business. It was founded in 1914 in Roxbury, Massachusetts, uh, where my great-grandfather, Athens Spiliotopoulos, uh, delivered coats and aprons with a horse and wagon to the fish pier in Boston. Um, you know, we've, we've certainly come a long way. Um, but in 1933, we purchased a location in South Boston um, and, you know, built the laundry on, on that site. Um, my great-grandfather had three children that, that took on the second generation in the business through the 40s and the 50s, and during World War II and the Korean War, the, the plant proudly manufactured garments for the U.S. Navy. Um, multiple acquisitions over the 60s enabled us to expand throughout New England with additional locations in New Hampshire and Cape Cod and Springfield. In the 70s, uh, my uncle Arthur and my father Chris took over operations and expanded the business exponentially. Um, as the company grew, uh, Chris Filios, my father, had a vision to build a state-of-the-art facility that would enable Crown to grow and innovate in the future while keeping as many employees as possible. So, um, you know, we had, we had a location in South Boston, a location in Fall River, and you know, the space was very tight in South Boston, low ceilings, and the environment in Fall River was just not the safest work environment. So it was really what triggered my dad to start, you know, looking for alternative solutions. Um, in October, um, or sorry, the, the, so my dad was really spent probably five years looking for, for the right property, somewhere that um, was easy to keep as many people employed with the company as possible. And that led to a, a purchase of a 21 acres uh, property in Brockton, and we invested over $18 million to, to design and build a 94,000 square foot facility. Um, Work closely with Acon um, to make that happen. Chuck Riley's here today. Uh, in October 2014, uh, you know, we got together and had the official groundbreaking ceremony in Brockton. Um, you know, to, to celebrate the, the, the consolidation of our two locations. Um, unfortunately, my dad passed away just before we opened the uh, facility. Uh, but I, you know, I really think it's, um, you know, it's what he envisioned, and it's going to allow us to continue to grow as a company in the future and innovate and, and continue to, you know, to believe in sustainability and operational excellence. So. Today, my uncle Arthur um, is in his 80s. He's still very active in the business, and my cousin Plato and I are, are really running the day-to-day -day operations as, as co-presidents. So, a little bit about the history. So now, now just uh, some information about 
you know, what, what we were able to leverage when we came to Brockton. I pulled some of this information from the application that was submitted. So the, this was in regards to the tip that we received. Um, essentially, retention of 30 full-time jobs, uh, five new full-time jobs. Um, obviously, the Brockton residents would be, um, would be folks that we would, we definitely would be open to hiring. And you know, looking at, at, at positions from a variety of different skill sets and experience from equipment operators to folders and plant managers and service and production folks. Um, uh, you know, at the time when, when we submitted the application, it was estimated that between our employees in Fall River and, and South Boston, that we were, you know, spending upwards of three hundred thousand dollars annually with with local businesses. So that was something that was communicated to Brockton as another benefit for for bringing Crown to Brockton. Um, you know, we, we certainly have a, a, a history of, of community involvement. These are some initiatives that we highlighted prior to moving uh, to Brockton. Uh, but you know, really re revitalizing the the, uh, the property that was underutilized, and uh, really the, the opportunity for Brockton to develop it into a state-of-the-art facility. Um, it, this was the old Fairfield Farms location on Battle Street, and you know, when we purchased the building, uh, the property, there was a 60,000 square foot freezer building and a 100,000 square foot foundation that was left over. So it was. Um, very overgrown and not not the most attractive um, you know state for a lot of the residents that live live nearby um, and so the other the other uh, obviously initiative is, is keeping Crown uh, a prominent company in, you know in the Massachusetts in Massachusetts and in Brockton uh, so as far as the the tax increment financing you know it's a, a 13 year um, exemption term you know starting when we really received the certificate of occupancy and um, we ended up purchasing the land for four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars we did end up spending about uh, one and a half million dollars cleaning up the site there was you know some environmental issues with the freezer building and asbestos panels and underground oil tanks so there was um, a significant cost in cleaning up the, the site to begin with, but um, you know we, we essentially are exempt from the the tax that would come with incremental value um, of the property over the 13 years. So, um, in our estimates, we've we've saved you know over a million dollars um, in, in in taxes over the last 10 years. Um, like I said, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years. Um, and it's, it's also a little bit um, hard to believe that that 85% exemption is going to be going to a 10% exemption next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other, the other um, uh, really tool that we leveraged was the Economic Development Incentive Program, the EDIP. This is primarily based on the expectation of adding new jobs, um, creating five new permanent jobs, three within the first two year. Uh, two years of being in Brockton, one in the third year, an additional one in the fourth year. Um, these these tax credits are specific to your Massachusetts income, and it was estimated that we um, were able to receive a thousand, a hundred thousand um, dollars in tax credits um, based on twenty thousand dollars per full-time employee created within the Gateway City. Um, I would say that since we moved to Brockton. Um, you know, we had between the Fall River and the and the South Boston location, about 75 to 80 employees. And um, you know, over the last 10 years, we've uh, we've added about 45 to 50 full-time employees. So um, it's been a, a great success for for our family business to be able to have more space, have higher ceilings, and capacity in our laundry to to do more laundry and service more customers. So. Um, we're, we're certainly thrilled with the decision that, you know, really my dad uh, was driving uh, for, for many years. And just to, to wrap up, these are, this is a picture of what the old building looked like. Um, it was the Fairfield Farms um, building, and prior to that, the um, Howard Johnson facility, where they were um, manufacturing things like ice cream and um, macaroni and cheese, I believe, was one of their other things. So this is what it looks like today. 
um, you know, we're, we're in the image business, so it's important for our, for our site to be clean and professional looking. Um, I'm excited to, to be able to, to give a tour to, to anyone that wants to come after and, and um, learn a little bit more about Crown. Sustainability is a, is a core value for our company. Um, you can see by the solar, but you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're in the reusable business, so anything we can do to utilize less water and save on energy um, makes sense economically as well as um, for, the, for the environment as well. Um, this last slide, I don't know if you can see it, is um, I, my, my father, uncle, and cousin, and then Lynn and Mary Waldron, who we work closely with. Um, Lynn was uh, very, very involved in the tax incentives, um, and Mary was very involved in just um, kind of introducing us to the right people, um, support from uh, former Mayor Balzati. Um, and like I said before, we're, we're excited to be in Brock, and it's hard to believe it's been 10 years. And um, look forward to um, to touring the facility with any of you after the panel concludes. Thank you. Thank you, George. And I'm a factory guy, and I've toured his facility, and I can I can attest that he's got an awesome facility. Next on the uh, on the agenda is uh, Lynn Tukarzik. Lynn. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here, and it's great to see so many familiar faces as well with this huge, huge crowd and audience. First of all, I'd like to thank Chris Cooney for inviting me today. Um, Chris, congratulations to you and all your accomplishments here in the region. It's totally amazing. Um, I'd also like to recognize Peter Foreman. Hello, Peter. Again, I was at your annual meeting last week. That was phenomenal. The 2030 vision is so, so intriguing, and congratulations to you as well. And also, just being part of this whole South Shore Leadership Program, it's so inspirational um, to me because, just quickly, I know um, that it, my bio was read, and yes, we negotiate tax incentives, but I'm actually a retailer by trade. I used to have my own woman's apparel shop. I'm from Nada, the other home of champions, by the way. Okay, it's uh, fluidity, of course. And uh, so it's kind just of debatable. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I had a, a woman's apparel shop in the town of Whalen, which is the town uh, contiguous to, to Nada. And so it's been a journey. Yes, I'm a retailer by trade, um, and you'll hear some of the story. But um, again, I'm just so pleased um, to be here and part of this um, leadership group as well. Um, so we help companies save cash. We help ne companies identify, negotiate, and secure state and local tax incentives. If companies have plans to grow and expand, create jobs, they could be looking for a new building, looking for a lamp parcel. I don't know where the time has gone, but yes, I did start off um, in retail then transitioned, I actually worked for the governor's office of business development. From there, I was with Ernst & Young, negotiating their tax incentive practice all over the country. Then I wanted to enhance my quality of life. So we launched our firm, again, I don't know where the time has gone, 20 years ago. We're celebrating our 20th year in business, negotiating tax incentives. Thank you. It alone. We have a phenomenal team. Um, on our team, we have a tax attorney, a CPA, a local assessor, and all of our other team members are all former state and local government officials. So we hope to meet all the expectations uh, with having a phenomenal team. We're also very proud of our track record. We, and you'll, you'll see some of the stories that um, I will be presenting, but we're very honored to work, of course, with Crown. Um, which I will mention a little later on as well. Uh, I can't believe it's 10 years ago. Um, we, we represent Moderna um, three times in the town of Norwood. Um, and when we started working with them, no one really even knew how to spell their name. This was back in 2016, fast forward. It certainly is a household name. Um, Millicor Sigma, Waters Corporation, TripAdvisor, Curig, uh, Martinetti, Cox Engineering, um, in Randolph, Amramp, which we'll be chatting about, Cape Cod Lumber, 
uh, and so many others. We're just very proud of our team and our track record to help them stay competitive in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. So again, I mentioned that our firm, Business Development Strategies, is assisting companies, again, to find ways um, to offset their project costs. You know, many companies are conducting site searches. They need to find sites. They've outgrown their buildings. They've outgrown their space. But of course, during this time, they're trying to put a team together of real estate advisors, of construction companies, their architect, their bankers. And I know I have to give a shout out also to Chuck Riley with Daycon. Chuck, there you are. And um, thanks for being here this morning. What a phenomenal um, company in Massachusetts that really has made a difference and again, helping to keep these companies com competitive. Um, also, I know there are many bankers in this room, um, South Shore Bank, um, so that's really great. I see a lot of um, my colleagues here, Steve Dupree um, here, and from Eastern Bank, I know uh, a lot of the representatives from Eastern Bank are here as well. Um, also, uh, when we talk about financing, there could be some creative financing options, and one of my former colleagues from Mass Development is here, Joe Rivers. Hey, Joe, at the back of the room. Okay, there you are. So, when we're talking about incentives, the type of programs that we're focusing on, and why are we focus, focusing on these industries? Because these are the industries that the state is focusing on, the growth sector companies in Massachusetts, manufacturing, life sciences, innovation, technology, high-end distribution. And companies are trying to make corporate real estate decisions. And so, with the surge in costs, whether it's construction costs, whether it's inflation, interest rates, payroll, these tax incentives are more important than ever. Next slide. So the program we're going to be talking about is the state's Economic Development Incentive Program. The state administers this program and they allow municipalities to participate. And since January of 2010, fast forward to December of 2022, the numbers really speak for themselves. As you can see, jobs retained, job, jobs created, and 14 billion, yes, that is with a B, of private investment into the state of Massachusetts. This program has been up and running since 1993, but guess what? It's still a mystery program. There are so many companies that don't know about this program, and they end up expanding and spending 20 million, 50 million, 100 million, and beyond, and unfortunately, the program's not retroactive and they've left substantial <coughs> cash on the table. I don't think that George Spilios and his team would have favored that, to leave that type of cash, over a million dollars of cash on the table. And back in 1993, there was lots of alphabet soup, ETAs, EOAs, all types, no longer required. There were sweeping legislative changes back in 2010 to 2019. When I first started with the state, there were only 35 communities that could offer tips. That is so hard to believe. Then it kept increasing and increasing to about 200. And then the legislature just finally said, we feel that it sh this economic development tool should be available in every corner of the Commonwealth. And so now, again, no more requirements for ETAs, EOAs, and some other acronyms. Next slide, please. So, when it comes to project eligibility, what types of companies, again, I mentioned the types of industries, but companies need to meet certain criteria. Um, and by the way, this isn't just frosting on the cake, this type of program, but it's for companies that could be relocating its operations from one community to another in Massachusetts. Uh, renovating a building, their own building, and maybe a portion of it is underutilized and they would like to renovate their building, that's eligible. Uh, it could be a purchase or a lease, obviously putting a shovel in the ground is in, you know, in a perfect world, but it can be a purchase or a lease. We get calls all day long, well, I'm leasing, I don't know if I'm eligible because I'm not the taxpayer of record, and yes, because the incentives are eligible to the job creator and who is ever paying the real estate taxes. And it's typically through a triple net lease, so it's typically the, the, the job creator, the tenant. And so the criteria that the companies need to meet is 
One, they need to be creating new permanent full-time jobs in Massachusetts. And how many new jobs under the law? One. One new permanent full-time job. Well, and that's not too hard to do, although I can say that I don't think that the cities and towns are going to be jumping for joy if you say, I'm going to be creating one job. However, it could be a retention project, and that's very, very important as well. So the program can be a little flexible. The second is generating new real estate investment, which equals bringing new tax revenue into the municipality. That is a requirement, new tax revenue. So if you put a shovel in the ground, that's all new assessed value, that's all new taxes, that can work. Or if you're renovating a building, it could be a warehouse, going to manufacturing, or going to life science, that could work. So it's really, it's economic development. It's bringing jobs and bringing new revenue due to a private investment to a municipality. But let me tell you, timing is essential. It's like a fine science. Sometimes it's like a science project, okay? And the tax incentives need to be secured with the cities or towns before the company signs a lease or before they close on a property, if it's a, a purchase. Uh, because all of these programs have to go to town meeting, if it's a town or a city council, and if they've already made a commitment, you know, the residents are pretty savvy today and so aren't the local officials, and they would say, well, they've already made a commitment. Why, you know, they're coming regardless if we offer them a tax incentive or not. So timing is very essential. Of course, we always want the companies to have leverage. And again, if, it's, if the timing is off, uh, it's very, very unfortunate. The program is not retroactive. And then again, company, the CFOs of the companies are not too pleased when they hear that no one told me about the program. I didn't know. Again, it's a mystery program. Next slide. So again, this is just a snapshot of the types of incentives. There are state tax credits that could be eligible, abandoned building tax deductions, taking you know, a, a building that's been vacant for at least two years, 75% vacant, and revitalizing uh, that, that property. Regarding the state tax credit, this is really for companies that are non-manufacturers, excuse me, that are non-manufacturers or non-life science companies. Because if you're a manufacturer in Massachusetts and you're a registered manufacturer, then you're eligible for statutory tax incentives through the Department of Revenue. Um, and if you're a life science company, you would access them through the Massachusetts Life Science Center. It's a little silo oriented. Uh, but if it was any other type of company, potentially there could be a tax, uh, a state tax credit. And then the third bullet down is municipal real estate tax relief, which is known as a TIF, tax increment financing which is really essentially a discount on future taxes. Uh, as George was mentioning in his presentation, the benefits that they received, it wasn't on the base, the land, the former a building that was there. It was based on the new building. It's the new taxes. And again, it's a discount. So essentially, the, the city or town doesn't lose a dime on the existing taxes. It's if should the company locate to the community, the city of town is in the position to generate new tax revenue and more jobs and of course the whole economic impact. But a TIF again is a incremental phase in a minimum of five years, a maximum of 20 years. In any given year, a minimum exemption of 1%, maximum of 100%. Personal property exemption could be another if eligible, machinery and equipment, that's all taxable. If you're a manufacturer, it's exempt. A special tax assessment, not as popular. Uh, because that impacts the entire base value, what the city or town could be collecting. But we actually have an example of that from one of the uh, projects that we worked on. And um, so there, there's also there's an approval process. It's just not a couple phone calls to your state legislators. Uh, it, if it's a town, it has to go before select board, finance committee, and town meeting, which means we have to get about 200 residents to support and embrace the project. So there's a lot of community outreach, a lot of community involvement. And if it's a city, it's the mayor's approval as well as city council. And then of course it needs to be certified by the state because this is a state program. Um, but we assist you know, with the economic impact and making sure that everyone understands what the true benefits of keeping a, a company in your community or attracting. And so just a couple of examples. But again, I just wanted to mention the Crown Project. It was such a great project to work on. The, 
the city was extremely pro-business and really welcomed uh, Crown. So we were so appreciative of that. And the, so this project in East Bridgewater that I wanted to mention is 47. Is that on anyone's radar? Can I raise some hands if you've ever heard of 47? Well, I can, I can guarantee you that you've got merchandise uh, because this is the, uh, the company that is affiliated with the Red Sox and many other sports and you'll have to check out your hats and accessories the next time you put them on. Um, but this is 47 actually purchased uh, the former Shaw's distribution facility in East Bridgewater and they went through this process and they achieved a um, substantial uh, tax incentives. Next slide, please. Globe Composite Solutions, great company in Stoughton, and they just completed an on-site expansion. Um, it's a phenomenal company. They manufacture parts for submarines, so that's why you see the sub. That is a submarine, and it's really it, it's amazing to know what's in your backyard and all the amazing <coughs> products that are being made in Massachusetts. Um, so you can see the jobs retained, created, the level of private investment. And uh, we're very excited that they just completed uh, their project. And the last slide, uh, Amp Ramp, um, and Peter Foreman, thank you, uh, thank you so much for your involvement with this project to uh, attract them to the town of Randolph. This was a company they manufactured uh, wheelchair ramps, and they were uh, formerly in the city of Boston, um, in South Boston, and they conducted a site search for quite a bit of time, and they finally found a wonderful building um, in the town of Randolph, um, so you can see the jobs that they were retaining, creating, and by the way, this was a special tax assessment, which was secured uh, for AMRAMP, in the first three years uh, of locating there, they, on their real estate taxes, they paid zero, no real estate taxes. And it was a, a short term, a five year um, project. But the town of Randolph, very, very strong leadership, uh, Brian Howard, and they recognized the value of manufacturers, jobs, the whole economic impact in partnering with uh, businesses. Um, and I also wanted to mention that last week I was at um, a Mass Econ event at Gillette Stadium recognizing um, many companies, 15, not that many, 15 across the, the Commonwealth uh, for their economic impact. And I was so pleased to meet uh, the Brockton Beer Company. Uh, they received the gold award. And so I just wanted to share that in, since I'm in the city of Brockton. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lynn. Next speaker, Rob Corley. Thank you, Rich. And uh, again, want to thank Chris and the Chamber for having Neighbors Housing Solutions here, and and, um, and thank the Mayor for his support, too, of our organization over the last decade or so here in Brockton. Um, and in particular, to the South Shore leadership, to, to Jim, we have a senior staff member, Serenity Bellow, our resource development director that was involved in the South Shore leadership program. And, She's excellent, and we want to thank South Shore Bank for your support of our organization for a long time. We have board meetings there occasionally, and uh, board members from South Shore uh, on, on our team, so thank you. Um, so I want to make sure that um, Rob made us become the Matt Damon here of the Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel Show. We don't have time to get to him, so I'll be uh, I'll get some slides to briefly go through here uh, to tell you a little bit about our organization. So at NeighborWorks, um, we're operating in uh, quite a large region. We've been in business for about 40 years. Um, we employ uh, 130 um, staff in a variety of different locations, so the majority of which are here in Brockton. Uh, but we cover down Route 3, Route 24, and Route 95. Uh, and we have offices um, in uh, Quincy, Brockton, Kingston, Taunton, um, New Bedford, and soon to be Fall River. Um, and as part of that work, um, you can see that we're very focused on gateway cities um, and real estate development um, in those areas. We're part of NeighborWorks America. We are an independent nonprofit with a board of directors, uh, about 20 board, board members, many of which are Brockton residents. 
Um, and as part of Networks America, uh, it's a network of excellence, of which uh, we're rated exemplary. We get uh, audited annually and every three years on site. And this allows us to uh, access federal dollars to leverage into the communities that we operate in. And over the last five years, um, <coughs> We've been part of over $850 million worth of investment in our region um, in partnership with Maine Works America. Uh, and um, again, this is not a franchise. We're an independent uh, organization just like any other. Um, but being part of Maine Works America is a very good thing. It allows us to bring federal dollars here that otherwise wouldn't arrive. And that is patient capital for us, our very flexible dollars that we can um, utilize on the ground in the communities like Brockton, um, where we can decide how we want to use those funds. We provide a variety of different things. I'm going to focus a little bit on the real estate development, of course, um, but we also provide property management services. Um, we provide um, a family scattered site domestic violence shelter program uh, and home base. We provide construction management um, and owner's rep services to other nonprofit partners that may be interested in real estate development in the region. Um, we administer uh, the Section 8 program for the state of Massachusetts in the region with over uh, 4,000 households uh, that we operate in. Um, we also administer programs for the state like RAFT and HAF, which uh, 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 provide uh, grant funding to tenants and homeowners maybe facing foreclosure. Um, we have a CEFI where we do small business lending um, and technical assistance, um, as well as other programs, including down payment assistance for first time home buyers, which we help uh, home buyers purchase not only in Brockton but in other communities. And um, the majority of our uh, counseling staff, um, typically over a five year period, we average about 5,400 um, educated. Uh, first-time home buyers, and we have a staff of HUD certified counselors that do that work again primarily in Brockton. On the real estate development side of things, you see a couple of photos up here. Um, we have about a thousand units uh, that we own and operate, um, and we have approximately 300 additional units in the pipeline right now. Uh, the pictures you see here are just some past projects. Um, the one in the center uh, is in Quincy. It's called the Watson. Um, this was an HDIP project, as the mayor mentioned earlier, um, which is an, an important source for gateway cities. Uh, this is 142 units. Um, they won the Urban Land Institute Award of Excellence for Affordable Housing. It's a mixed income blend, uh, so it has 20% uh, market rate, 60% workforce, and 20% uh, straight uh, low-income housing tax credits is what we call it. Uh, to the right, we also do smaller projects. Is a homeless um, veterans project. This was in Marshfield. Again, a um, existing abandoned school that was vacant for years that we renovated and uh, made um, 10 new homes for homeless veterans. And on the left, you see another example, some of our special needs work. Uh, this is for um, our partner working. Um, that's for adults with developmental disabilities, um, deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, on the left, a new home in Quincy. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of work in partnership with other nonprofits, helping them develop their properties. This is an example of some senior housing. This is uh, under construction in Holbrook Center right now and will be complete um, in June. So you're welcome to come to that uh, ribbon cutting. But um, this is 72 units of senior housing, but you notice on the Ground level is a commercial component. This is a mixed use project. So again, we're focused on comprehensive community development. So it's not only affordability, and certainly we know that seniors need affordable housing, um, but we're also focused on the downtown area of Holbrook and trying to create spaces uh, for people to uh, invest in businesses to thrive. So focusing a little bit more on Brockton, uh, in the Brockton area, Brockton uh, has certainly some assets, including its access to the highways, but also its um, transit-orientated development opportunities around the three uh, commuter rail locations on Montello and downtown. And here you see an um, example of four projects and where they're located in proximity to the commuter rail. And uh, these four projects represent $105 million worth of investment from NeighborWorks into these projects. 
um, 195 units or residences, one nano brewery that was just mentioned a minute ago, uh, the Brockton Beer Company, and uh, 6,600 square feet of commercial um, property here in Brockton. The Sycamore Main, which is now complete, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's on the corner of Main and Frederick Douglass um, near the Sycamore um, Liberty Tree. This was 48 units of mixed income housing, and on the ground floor, of course, is Brockton Beer. Um, this project and pretty much every project we're doing in Brockton was in, done in partnership, uh, in particular with the city, um, and Rob, and he'll tell you more about that, I'm sure, uh, and the mayor, but this particular site was abandoned for, for decades, the old Kresge site, and um, empty for quite a long time. And you know, this is an example of where the market really wasn't going to deliver for this project. Um, so working with the city and some of that patient capital I mentioned, we were able to acquire this property and slowly put together the stack of financing to make this amazing project happen. Including the investment in the Brockton Beer Company, not only did our CFI invest funds in Brockton Beer, but also the city in helping with the fit out, uh, use some federal dollars um, to help uh, Brockton Beer uh, get established. And as you can see, they're doing quite well. Um, Great place if you haven't been, I highly recommend it. And in talking to the owners of Brockton Beer, which is locally owned, minority owned, they, um, they're they experiencing, at least in their numbers, about 60% of the folks that are coming to Brockton Beer are from outside of the city. So this type of investment is, is key. So when people come into Brockton, they see what Brockton's all about, and they see that building, that beautiful building, and this, um, uh, this business. And again, that's mixed income housing or some might say affordable housing, but this is a significant investment. It's very positive for the downtown. Not far from there is the Lincoln School. This is an abandoned school that actually the, the mayor stepped out, but I think the mayor went to this school, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it's been <laughs> abandoned for quite some time. And um, it's, this we're converting into 37 units for senior housing. Um, a beautiful historic building, blonde brick, slate roof, um, this we're actually cutting a breaking ground on next month. So this project's funded, coming out of the ground. It's, it's a real project and we're very excited about it. A couple more here. Uh, Brockton South TOD, TOD, this is down by Campello's train station. This is a 94 unit mixed income housing development. Um, again, with that ground floor commercial that I highlighted with uh, Brockton Beer. It's right across from the train station um, and Heath Park. Um, Keith Park, sorry, and it's um, a, just a great location, but also another example of how combining uh, mixed-use development, mixed-income development um, is what we're looking for, and uh, with great support from the city, who's invested a lot of money in the infrastructure and around mm -hmm. this train station. Uh, and lastly, there's a boutique hotel uh, that's also been abandoned for quite some time. It's uh, the Grayson Hotel. And if you look at its size, this is typically not something that, again, the market's going to deliver on. Um, it's a historic hotel. And so uh, we purchased a hotel uh, in partnership with the city, or the city uh, with the city. And this is 94 units. That's a typo. It won't be 94 units. I can promise you that. If you could read that, I, I can. But uh, it's 16 units um, of housing that will be, again, above retail component here. So we're looking to. Um, activate the lower level of this area, which used to be a recording studio or something long ago, um, but to the right, sort of a bodega style retail there, which would be good for the downtown community. And then on the left, some community space uh, for the Sycamore and Main. This is a, right across the street from the Liberty Tree. Um, so we're very excited about that project. Um, so for us, uh, Brockton, as the mayor always says, if, if Brockton was a stock, I'd be buying. Uh, we've been buying in Brockton for quite some time um, and having some of these developments uh, over the last uh, five or ten years, these don't happen quickly. It takes partnership. Uh, it takes a city that's willing to partner. It takes um, a lot of private support and um, this is years in the making for NeighborWorks, um, but we're, we're very excited about all this work and to be part of uh, the broader, greater Brockton community here. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. And last, but certainly not least, Rob May. Good afternoon, everyone. I see my time is up, so... Uh, <laughs>
Uh, thank you all for coming out here. I'm going to go off script for just a little bit. I am really excited to see folks here from the South Shore Chamber and the South Shore Leadership um, joining us here in Metro South. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, the time is now for Route 3 and Route 24. We need to do everything we can to position ourselves for the next growth cycle. I know Peter's done a great job with the uh, uh, 2030 plans um, where they address housing and workforce and infrastructure, and we're doing the same here along our corridor, but um, we need to build a coalition together. Southeast Massachusetts has been overlooked for far too long, and there are regional projects and regional uh, activities that are, are, are going to be good for everyone. And one of those that I've been working with the mayor on and our friends at the Old Colony Planning Council is to get the MBTA to invest in uh, infrastructure to remove the bottlenecks on the Old Colony line at Dorchester and in Quincy. And if we could get rid of those and do a little bit of double tracking there, we could see a train every half hour along the old colony line into Boston, and that would really change the economic equation for all of us. We have uh, South Coast coming online, uh, that's wonderful. They're all going to get bottlenecked into Quincy, and we have to, to, to do that. But Metro West, uh, Burlington, and the, Route 3 the other Route 3 corridor, they will continue to eat our lunch economically if we don't all work together as Southeast Massachusetts and get the state to pay attention to us and make investments down here. So with that, whoops, oh. wrong direction. There you go. Ooh. Okay. I like it. I like it. So um, this is an overview, overview of Brockton. And uh, we're going to be talking about these uh, four or five different redevelopment areas that we've been working on. Um, over the last nine years. Um, and I should say that uh, I have been with the city for nine years. Um, I've worked with three great mayors, all with very um, different personalities, different temperaments, different work styles. However, they all have the same vision, and that was to advance Brockton to see a very strong and dynamic downtown, and then to bring that growth out to the rest of the neighborhoods. And so, we started our work um, in, in downtown, and this is both downtown and Sycamore Grove, or excuse me, and uh, Trout Brook. Um, so downtown is basically on the west side of the tracks, and nine years ago, eight years ago, we created a, a redevelopment vision. Um, the downtown action strategy was adopted by city council. They also created a downtown uh, urban renewal plan and a diff plan, so our ability to um, fund projects uh, through incremental uh, uh, improvements. Uh, we're able to, to have growth, pay for growth, and reinvest that back in the community. We then went around and created every single incentive district known to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and layered them on top of each other. Uh, we call that the seven layer dip. <laughs> but um, it, you know, we have the smart growth zoning, which allows for uh, more flexibility. We have um, uh, new market tax credits that are available there, uh, LIHTC tax credits, the HDIP, the Housing Development Incentive Program, which is a ta state tax credit for market rate um, development, which is in gateway communities, um, historic tax credits, and there's something else. Oh, opportunity zones, federal opportunity zones. So they've all been uh, uh, layered on top of each other. We then um, started to work on the east side of the tracks, and that's an area in the northeast that uh, we're calling Trout Brook because it sounds so much nicer than the old CSX rail yard. Uh, <laughs> you've got to create curb appeal. Um, it looks like a long shot. I mean, how is CSX going to work with the city, and who's going to want to do this, and who's going to want to do that? Well, the Redevelopment Authority, we created an urban real district. The Redevelopment Authority just put out a request for interest and qualifications. We had four firms submit. We've narrowed that down to two very realistic 
um, uh, partners that we are now, uh, we, the Redevelopment Authority, is uh, requesting full proposals for. We will choose a partner and then uh, approach uh, CSX on the acquisition and redevelopment of a 45 acre site that is adjacent to downtown. It's a stone's throw from the commuter rail station and is really expanding our downtown footprint. There's also, um, so there's been several projects that have been built downtown. Chris has talked about a few of them. Uh, we've had over 500 new residential developments, uh, residential units, excuse me, um, opened uh, in the last few years. There's another 500 and some on the horizon that are in the permitting process. Um, we've built a 400 uh, plus space parking garage. So all these things are, are coming together and it's really starting to, to show growth, uh, show dividends in downtown. Uh, the next area, uh, this is up at Lovett Brook. We, we've got a brook theme going on here. Uh, this is the area around Good Samaritan Medical Center. And it's, it's a little heavy green, but you can see that there is a lot of underutilized property around that facility. Most of it's owned by a REIT in Alabama. So uh, we've created a master plan for the area, and now we have money from the Commonwealth to create an urban renewal district. We're working with Good Samaritan and with the REIT to um, come up with a redevelopment strategy for this area that focuses on um, mixed-use development along Oak Street, which is across the top, um, and uh, biomanufacturing uh, around the hospital campus. I should say that this is also the home of Harbor One Bank in the right north east corner, up in the right. I don't have a pointer. Um, or do I? <laughs> uh, no. uh, I tease cats all day. But uh, this is a, a great corridor on um, Route 24, has great visibility, great access into the city, and is going to show a lot of potential. Uh, we've then and just started a kickoff process for the Campello neighborhood. Uh, there's another train station down in this area, and a lot of the old uh, what used to be the Auto Mile in Brockton, where uh, all the car dealerships used to be. They've all moved out to the highway, and so there's some large sites for redevelopment down here. Some of you might know where the Kmart Plaza is. That's in this area. Um, Rob is uh, one of several developers who are working on projects around uh, the main commercial node uh, on, on Main Street. And again, I wish I had a minute. Um, but we have approximately, well, 200, 250 units in, um, in process here. A good half of them have already been permitted. The rest are, are um, coming up uh, through the, the uh, land use process. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of, of new development here. This, this will stabilize the community and really start it on an upward trajectory. And that's not to say that we're not um, working at the same time in the Montello Corridor, um, which is on the north side of the city, again, around another train station. And there's uh, significant opportunity here. Um, all three of these train stations are affected by the new MBTA 3A legislation, which requires higher density development around uh, train stations so that um, and um, failure to do so will see um, loss of, of access to state funds. But uh, we're confident to be able to use this uh, to really move forward on and get our zoning right so that we're ready for the ne next round of, of development. And then the, the last big enchilada is the fairgrounds and what is going to happen to that. Uh, it's a 65 acre site all owned by one family, and uh, there's a lot of potential here. But it backs up onto a residential neighborhood. It's on Belmont, so it's got you know nice access to uh, Route 24. But how do we optimize development at this site so that we get what the neighbors and the residents want, that we get jobs, we get tax increment, and not overload the schools and not overload um, the roadways. So we are applying for an Economic Development Administration grant to 
um, do a, a, a year-long study of this site. It's on the market. It may go faster than us, but we control the zoning, so ha <laughs> <laughs> um, And then I think that was it. Yes. Um, so um, Brockton, where better begins, it's a, uh, a campaign that was developed by the Brockton Partnership, uh, which are several of the great community leaders that are here in this room and um, helped fund this program. There's a great video, I, I won't play it because we're all kind of late, but um, Brockton is the kind of place where you can go and start a life, buy a home, attend good schools, have great access to transit, enjoy some of the great amenities, you know, world-class parks and museums that we have here, enjoy all of Southeast Massachusetts from this central location. So with that, I will shut up. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, um, and thank you to all of our uh, speakers. Great presentations, and, and just so you know, all of the slides from each presentation will be available online. Thank you. Next, a few chamber updates. Uh, we have a ribbon cutting at Healthier U Wellness Partners, Friday, April 28th from 11 to 1. Uh, another ribbon cutting at Rockland Recover Recovery Behavioral Health, Thursday, May 4th. That's from 12 to 2 p.m. Save the following date for our Small Business Awards and Expo on Friday, May 19th, 12 to 1.30. Business After Hours at Abington Bank, Wednesday, May 24th, from 5 to 7 p.m. Now, as is our, our custom, we have door prizes, okay? Oh. I need a new door. You need yeah. a door? Yeah. Oh, door. Okay, <laughs> take, take your pick. We'll, we'll, we'll speak to the management. <laughs> um, we always, every month we choose a member to be highlighted in the, their profile highlighted in the action report. And this month's company will be Felicita Superlabega. Kate Ooh. Verdi and Association. <laughs> we have two other door prizes, okay? And these, these are each a $25 Amex gift card. Nice. Brian Hoffman, Red Ball Promotions. <laughs> Second winner, Marcy Venezia, Above the Clouds. So, so all of you, uh, check in with the, uh, the, the table at the lobby to collect your prizes. Right. Before we conclude, I want to remind everyone the Leadership Metro South program is accepting applications now for the new cohort that will begin meeting this coming fall. Please see Catherine Schofield or Joanne Tully for more information. I also want to thank a few people and organizations. So today's ambassador team, South Shore Bank, Atlantic Mechanical, Rich Morgan, Rich Morgan Photography, Brockton Community Access, The Enterprise, Mayor Robert Sullivan, today's interviewer, Stan Blackmer, Jim Dunphy, Joe Grotto, George Spilios, Lynn, no, no, now I'm stumbling on you, Tukarzik. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, oh, right. right, thanks. Okay, Rob Corley, Rob May and Leadership South Shore. That concludes our program. Glad to see everyone here, and enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.